Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans number 44. I'm Fred Green. Whenever I'm asked about which is my favorite Golf Smarter episode, this episode, number 108 from January 2008, is always in my top five. Our guest is author, screenwriter, TV creator, TV producer, Mark Frost. Today we're going to hear about the incredible story from his book called The Match, The Day the Game of Golf Changed Forever. Of course, you're familiar with the AT&T Pebble Beach Pro-Am that is an annual announcement that the golf season is getting underway. But its origins in 1937 at Rancho Santa Fe in San Diego, California, was a single round that started out as something called the Crosby Clambake, hosted by singer and movie star Bing Crosby. Play was suspended in World War II, but in 1947, the event moved north to Monterey, California as a 54-hole event, and it's still being played there. But Crosby used this as an opportunity for the Hollywood elite to get together with touring golf pros and top-ranked amateurs. The history of this event in relation to the golden age of golf, Hollywood, and West Coast golf course architecture all comes together in the match. You may be familiar with Mark Frost as the writer of the movie screenplay, The Greatest Game Ever Played. He co-wrote the movie Fantastic Four and was a writer on The Six Million Dollar Man. Mark was also the head writer of TV's Hill Street Blues and co-creator and executive producer of Twin Peaks. Now, I know that Golf Smarter Mulligans is dedicated to game improvement, but trust me on this one. This is a mind-blowing story about a match that was a single round in 1956 pitting Ben Hogan and Byron Nelson against amateurs Harvey Ward and Ken Venturi. And it's probably my all-time favorite golf book. Golf Smarter Mulligans is brought to you by TwoGuysWithGolfBalls.com, offering premium used golf balls for anybody who wants to save money on golf balls because you know you lose them. Don't you? We all do. It's just a way of life. Maybe you're good enough to play around a two, three rounds without losing a ball. That's pretty awesome. But after three or four rounds, a ball, you still want to be playing with it? I'm not so sure. Congratulations for doing that. But the point is, golf balls are really expensive, especially if you know you're going to lose them. And playing with golf balls that you find in the woods is not such a good idea because if you're complaining about consistency, then why are you playing with a different ball every time you play? The answer to this is twoguyswithgolfballs.com. They hand inspect every single ball, they sanitize them, and then they grade them into three different categories of eagle, birdie, and par. Eagle being like a brand new ball that maybe was hit once. No X outs, no seconds, These are quality, premium used golf balls. And most of the time, you're going to be paying half price, maybe even less. The key here, when you go to twoguyswithgolfballs.com, is use Golf Smarter at checkout, and you'll get 10% off every order, every time with a coupon code. Now, that's twoguyswithgolfballs.com, and that discount of 10% with the coupon code GOLFSMARTER expires on April 1, 2020. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Thank you so much. Uh, This book, The Match, The Day the Game of Golf Changed Forever, is fabulous. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm really glad you're enjoying it. I I really am. I'm not done. And if you tell me the ending, I'm going to smack you. But I need to know, first thing, if this wasn't covered by anybody, if the press wasn't there, and it was a secret among a bunch of people. How'd you get the photograph for the cover? Um, I, I actually used a time machine for that. Uh, I was able to no. I I, um, I was able to find a photograph taken from the actual tournament, uh, the, the Bing Crosby Clambake, uh, a day later of the first tee at, at Cyprus. So it, it's not actually a photograph of the match itself. Okay. Uh, it was the closest we could uh, approximate. And it, it, it is the first tee, and I believe at least one of our guys is in the photo. Uh, I think it's either Hogan or Venturi. All right. Now, before we go any further, I really, um, I'm going to just open the floodgate here and let you go. Can you please give us 
without you know without the ending yes. but give us yeah give us the full story tell us what this book is about tease us so we go out and buy lots of copies well it's it's about the greatest private golf match ever played on american soil and uh, if you're like most people you've never even heard of it the few people in the game or who know the history of aficionados pros they all know it it's like uh it's like bigfoot it's like a uh an urban uh, legend in the game, and it's talked about a lot and had been talked about a lot, and that's how I first heard about it, from uh, actually from Ben Crenshaw, uh, who, who said, this is one of the great stories in all of golf, and you should look into it. And I'd gotten to know Ken Venturi uh, when I was writing uh, The Greatest Game Ever Played, and that led me to a series of conversations with him, and, and that led me into wanting to write the book. So... The story is as follows. The setup is, um, if, if you read The Greatest Game Ever Played or, or saw the movie, you'll remember um, Eddie Lowry, who was Francis We Met's little 10-year-old caddy, uh, who helped him win the U.S. Open in 1913 and kind of put golf on the map in this country. And Eddie uh, was a very uh, ambitious guy, as, as you could tell even at that age, and he grew up to become the most successful Lincoln Mercury dealer in the United States. Mm. Um, but to almost nobody's surprise who knew him. He just had that kind of go get him attitude. And uh, by the early 50s, he's a, he's a multimillionaire. He's, he's set up in business. He's on the USGA Executive Committee. But he'd always harbored this, this desire um, to try to find another great amateur champion, like Francis we met, who could win the U.S. Open or the Masters, which has now come along and become the second... Uh, big important uh, major championship in our country. Uh, so Eddie used to uh, go on the lookout for these guys, and if if he found people he really thought could play, he'd hire them as car salesmen if they had the knack, and they would work on his showroom floors and his lots, selling cars in the morning, and then they'd go off and play client golf in the afternoon. And it it was like a you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. They they were able to make a very handsome living and attract a lot of business to his uh, to his car business and um, he helped them with their careers um, and, and also if he found some really good players he would pair up with them on the weekends and play these big stakes private matches and Eddie loved to gamble he loved the action and and he made a lot of money this way um, so about the mid 1950s he's got two young guys working for him that he's convinced are the best he's seen since the days, the glory days of the amateur game with we met and Jones. And they are um, a fellow from North Carolina uh, named Harvey Ward, who's uh, kind of Lee Trevino before there was Lee Trevino. He's, he's a, a, a playboy. He's a charmer. He's a naturally gifted athlete who never practices and then just goes out, out and beats the pants off people. He'd, he'd won the NCAA championship in 1948 for North Carolina. He he won the British Amateur in '53, I believe, maybe '52. And in 1955, he wins he wins the U.S. Amateur Championship. So he's the real deal. Um, Bob Jones thinks he's the best amateur to enter the game since he'd left it in 1930, and pretty much everybody agrees. Uh, so Harvey's in Eddie's stable, and the other fella is a young, uh, at this point, 25 year old um, Bay Area kid who been a, a golfer of incredible promise and won a lot of junior championships and had just gotten back from an 18-month stint in the Army um, when he went to work for Eddie as a car salesman, and his name was Ken Venturi. So uh, Ken and Harvey really hit it off. They started playing um, best ball matches against people for, for Eddie and, and just on their own, and in the three years prior to this match, they had never lost. They'd played something they figured over a hundred matches together, never lost a match. So, come early 1956, Eddie, as he always does, gets invited down to play in the uh, the Bing Crosby Pro Am, then known as the Clambake, the first big professional amateur golf tournament in America. Uh, Crosby really invented the genre, and um, it's become a huge cultural event now. People come from all over the country. It's it's starting to show up on television. Um, it's it's a hoot, and everybody wants to play in it, and everybody wants to win it because there's a lot of dough and there's a lot of again a lot of side betting uh, and action that goes on that 
makes it really lucrative. In fact, Eddie, the year before, won the Pro-Am with his partner, Byron Nelson. He and Nelson have been friends since 1937. So uh, Eddie's right there in the middle of everything, and he's, and he's brought these two amateurs down, and he finds himself at a cocktail party on Monday night, uh, the week of the clam bake, uh, kind of the kickoff night. Um, and he's bragging to anybody who'll listen that his two young players will win a best ball match against any two players in the world. And his host, uh, a fellow named George Coleman, who's a, a fellow member at Cyprus and Augusta and a, 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 another big mogul and a very good golfer himself, um, takes him up on it and says, are you, are you telling me you're too amateurs, your two kids could beat any two players in the world, pros included. And Eddie stands his ground and says, absolutely, and, and I'll put my money where my mouth is. So uh, before you know it, they've agreed to a tea time the following morning at 10 o'clock at Cypress Point, and Eddie's agreed to bring Harvey Ward and Ken Venturi, and this guy says, I'm going to bring a couple of fellas, and we'll, we'll see what's what. The next morning, uh, Eddie shows up and Harvey and Ken are there, and George Coleman uh, arrives with Ben Hogan and Byron Nelson, the two greatest living professionals. <laughs> um, I mean, it's the equivalent of saying you're going to bring a couple of college kids out to the first tee and somebody drives up with Tiger and Phil Mickelson. I yeah, mean, exactly. It's, uh, it's that shocking. Um, and in fact, Ken is so overwhelmed he has to go behind the clubhouse to warm up because he's too nervous to be on the range with those guys. Um, <laughs> Now that's the that's the setup, and it's uh, it, it's all true. It's all it's all uh, documented. And the, but the good news for for me is as a storyteller is that the the match that then ensues more than lives up to the billing. It's it's the greatest exhibition of golf between four extraordinary players that I've ever come across. I I can't find a uh, a similar uh, antecedent or or any other match that that even approaches it. That between the four of them, they shoot uh, they, uh, 27 birdies and an eagle. Uh, they, ha- they have only two holes and they, in par. Everything else is a birdie or an eagle. Uh, no one team is ever more than one up all the way through it. Um, and it, it's four kind of geniuses of the game playing out of their minds. Uh, and there's a lot of other kind of cross currents going on here it's this is a we don't think of it this way now but in mid 50s amateur golf still could stand toe to toe with the kind of players it could produce with the professional game the the pro game had really struggled for a long time it it started during the depression both hogan and nelson kind of went out during those years that you 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 made almost no money on the pro tour uh you barely uh were able to feed yourself it was a it was a hand-to-mouth existence you drove around uh, in beat-up cars from Texas to California to Florida. I think only, on average, the top five guys in the tournament finished in the money. And, wh- and let's talk, what do you mean by the money? Well, just what kind uh, of money are we money. talking about? I mean, to have any winnings at all. I mean, you might play, say, the Texas Open in um, 1945. In 1945, Byron Nelson won 18 tournaments on the PGA Tour. He won 11 in a row. Um... He made forty-two thousand dollars that year, and that was huge money. In and, that, and that's you know, in today's money, that's probably close to three hundred thousand. But still, think about what players are making today. And uh, uh, all Byron wanted to do was raise enough money to buy a ranch to quit playing golf. He hated the life of being an itinerant pro. It wasn't. It wasn't until the nineteen twenties that professional golfers were even allowed into the clubhouses of the the clubs where they were working. They were the hired hands, you know. They were the the second class citizens. So, and they had to be teaching pros just to be able to supplement this to correct? supplement themselves. And they they usually had the concession of things they sold in their pro shops to support them. But they were paid almost nothing. Um, and the idea of a pro who could be free of uh, ties to a club and just travel around and make money was an unheard of concept uh, until Walter Hagen. He was the only guy who really had ever done it. Um, and then when the Depression hit and golf kind of collapsed, uh, he became almost the only guy who'd ever done it until uh, Nelson and then Hogan were able to hit it big. So there's this real division in the game between the pro player and the amateur player. And the amateurs have always been the 
kind of custodians of the game. They've run and uh, founded and run the, the USGA. They organize the big tournaments. They tend to be upper-class people who play the game for, for fun and passion and excitement. And the, the pro game has always been kind of a poor relation in a way. Um, and the, pro, the, the amateur game at this point, with, in the persons of Ward and Venturi, are still clearly able to produce players of equal ability. And um, this is the only instance I've ever been able to find that's short from, you know, playing together in events like the Masters or um, uh, Open Championships, which means that they're open to everybody, pros and amateurs alike, where a, an amateur team takes on a pro team. The amateur team, uh, teams had tried to challenge uh, in 1952 and 53, Harvey Ward was on both the Walker Cup teams, which were extraordinary. They actually tried to challenge the pros' Ryder Cup team to see if they could have a a pro amateur competition, and the pros turned them down. They said, the, the reasoning being, if, look, if we get beaten by a bunch of amateurs, what does that do to our ability to make a living? They felt it would cut the legs out right from under them. So there's a real rivalry between the two sides of the game and and as near as i can tell this is the only time it ever really came to a head you get a sense that hogan really d- did not like playing against amateurs he didn't at all he didn't even like playing with an- amateurs i mean he uh he was a you know a kind of a irascible guy and he uh was a perfectionist and he took what he did very very seriously so um Unless it was, you know, maybe a big money investor who was going to come on board the Ben Hogan Company, um, he didn't usually go out of his way to be overly nice to to uh, amateurs. Um, and uh, the, oddly enough, the one exception, well, the two exceptions he'd made to the amateurs he'd met recently, happened to be the two guys he was playing that day. Ho- um, Hogan had taken Venturi under his wing, and and he just loved Harvey Ward. He loved his attitude. Hogan, being a kind of retiring and shy guy himself, had a real fondness for extroverts. He loved Jimmy Demerit, for instance, who was kind of the clown prince of the pro tour. And Harvey was very much in, in that mold, always cracking jokes and whistling and singing as he walked down the fairway and uh, winking at the crowd and uh, and making him laugh. And then he'd get over the ball and hit concentrate for the 10 seconds he was able to focus his attention span and move on. So... Uh, they, those guys all liked each other. Byron Nelson had been a mentor to both um, Venturi and Ward uh, through his relationship with Eddie Lowry. And most interestingly, Byron and Ben had known each other since they were 10 years old. They'd caddied together at the same course in Fort Worth, Texas, and had come up in the game together. They were the same age. They'd traveled uh, all through the Depression together as, as touring pros. And then Byron actually became the first of them to hit it big when he won the Masters in 37, and I think the PGA and the U.S. Open by the, uh, 1940. And at that point, Hogan, at age of age of 30, had never won a single tournament yet. So the the competitive nature of the game, and I think Hogan's uh, desire and drive to succeed, um, and Byron having already got there, kind of slowly drove them apart. So that by the time Byron retired from golf six years later, and and during that time he, by the way, never lost a head-to-head match with Ben. He always got the better of him. Um, from that point in 1946 until this date in 1956, Byron and Ben had never played a round of golf together. So it's kind of extraordinary that they were persuaded by George Coleman to step out and play as partners against these two young guys. So that's kind of the... The, the broader background of what's going on between these fellows as they as they trudge down to the first tee at Cypress, uh, Cypress Point that day, and as I said, what what then follows is absolutely transcendent and uh, takes place on I think one of the the most extraordinary golf courses in the world, um, and all that really forms the basis for the match. Well. Uh, it, to me, there was so many side stories, or there are some because I'm still reading. There is so many side stories um, that give you glimpses into the history that, as somebody who has taken up the game in the last ten years and and just loves to go out and play, and not really familiar with the history of the sport, you really paint a beautiful picture and give great substance to what was going on during 
which seemed to be like post World War II, a golden age of golf. Yeah, it kind of was. There were a lot of great players who had obviously developed in the years leading up to that. Uh, most of them through the school of hard knocks. You know, the the pros like Hogan and Nelson and Sam Snead. You have to put in that bunch. Uh, had all grown up poor, and uh, for many of them, golf was uh, almost akin to a sport like boxing, as a, a way out of poverty, at least a, a way into the lower middle class to uh, to grab a paycheck. If you had no formal education, but you could teach golf and and play a little bit, you could at least scratch out a living. The idea that um, a white collar professional, a guy like Harvey Ward, who was a college graduate and uh, had a, uh, a degree in economics, um, going out on the pro tour when he could take a job as a car salesman, make twice as much money, sleep in his own bed every night, and, and not have to travel. Harvey said, if I'd, if I'd had tried to turn pro in 1955, I would have had to win two out of every three tournaments I played in just to come close to the same income I was making off the course. And that's an important thing for people to remember and realize, that the, the rise of the pro game and the ability for these guys to make these what are now extraordinary livings is all built on the, the backs and the, and the effort of all these early pros who kind of blazed a trail and, and made the early tour happen. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a shocking thing to realize that um, the last thing Harvey Ward wanted to do uh, was turned pro, not only because he would, wouldn't make a living, because it would have disappointed his parents, you know, who'd put him through college. Uh, it's a very different world 50 mm-hmm. years ago. And, and, and I wanted the book, it's, with all these books, the golf books that I've done, the, both the, the Greatest Game Ever Played and the Bob Jones book, The, the, the Grand Slam, uh, I, I'm always trying to look at golf in its broader social context. What's going on historically at the time these guys are playing? What, what is the game... Uh, doing in relation to the the broad social movements that are that are happening around us in in our society, because golf's a pretty good barometer for that. And um, the other great thing about the game from a storytelling perspective is that the game truly does reveal character. I mean, everybody says it builds character too, and I think it does. But but more than any other sport you can think of that I can think of. Watching somebody play or playing alongside them or, or hearing about them tells you more about that uh, person than uh, any other sporting event that I've come across because the, the game's demands on you are so unique. The, the ability to be self-reliant and um, contained and uh, maintain that even keel that you need to do at the same time you're keeping that extraordinary focus and concentration well, the fact that you don't have a coach or you don't have a referee while you're playing. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly demanding. Right. You have to be your own referee, pretty much. Yeah, you're expected to call penalties on yourself. Exactly. Um, it's, just, it's a game that demands a lot of you to play well. And I think most of the guys who've made it to the top of the game have been not just great players, but for the most part, pretty fascinating people, too. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I've been lucky in, in being able to tell these stories and getting to know these people, some of them, you know, posthumously, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Why is it that golf, um, I mean, you, you've alluded to it, but why is it that, that golf uh, has produced such rich and dramatic events that work so well in literature? I mean, uh, only I would think that boxing and baseball do that as well. Yeah, those are the three sports that tend to produce the best. Exactly. Writing. I mean, football and basketball, maybe track and field, you know, but that was like a movie. Yeah. You know, the Jim Thorpe thing. And, and, but but uh, boxing and baseball seems to bring out the, the rich and lush uh, writings that, that you're able to produce. Well, I think that because the game is played, golf particularly, is played without a clock, without um, uh, – it's a different – uh, it's not on a uniform field. It's played. Every course is unique, uh, and because the interior life of what's going on inside a golfer uh, is so much richer, you're not trying to react to something. You're not reacting to a baseball coming at you 95 miles an hour. You're thinking, what am I going to do to a stationary object, and how am I going to get it from point A to point B, and the the unique challenges that that the course and the conditions and the competition place in your way to make that um, a less than likely proposition. I I think those are great obstacles. Um, 
And also, when you when you when you put a player into the the kind of pressure cooker of match play, in particular, which has always been, I think, the uh, the most exciting form of the game to watch, um, you get into this unique uh, mano y mano um, game of how can I pressure this guy into folding? Uh, how am I going to beat him? You know, it's not wrestling. It's like I can't take him down. But I got to figure out a way to do it with this club in my hand, and and with the ball as my proxy. And I, I think that's a fascinating arena to put two combatants in and see what happens. Um, and so golf, I think, is a uniquely interesting sport in that regard to write about because you can you don't need to worry about when's the next pitch coming. You don't need to think about there's only ten seconds left in the game. It's it's about what's going on inside this guy's head right now. And how is he going to make the impossible happen? And the, the great champions, the guys who have just uh, mesmerized us, from Bob Jones to Hogan to Nicholas and now Tiger, um, what you're seeing at work is a really unique human being. And what happens uh, in this game at the match is that you've got four guys playing at that level with that level of skill and all these really intricate and interesting relationships going on between them, all of which I go into during the course of the book. Um, and uh, you also have the benefit of this is because most people haven't heard of the event. It's unlike most sports books where you already know the conclusion. You really don't know what's going to happen. And, and, uh, and don't tell me. And I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Is the attraction for you as a writer or as a golfer? Well, it's both, really. I've, I've loved the game since I was a kid. I had a Scottish grandfather who um, used to regale me with stories about the game and, you know, the old country and um, how the caddies and the, the teachers and the, the architects came over from there to here to work for the rich people in and around New York City to build their courses and tutor their sons and daughters and how to play and it's a it's a really interesting history that's again uh, uh, quintessentially American. It's a story of immigration and assimilation, and as the all those um, facets of the game that had been established in Scotland for three hundred years um, are transmuted into the American version of it. It's a really interesting process. I'm sure that your goal is not to be the story here, but for me, reading this. You've got, like I said, so much going on. It's so rich. It's so beautifully written. Um, and you paint such beautiful pictures. I start thinking about you and your research process and what it took for you to do the research on this. How long did it take for you to do the research? And, like, how much time did you spend at Cypress Point? You know, you'll, you'll, go out, you'll go out to the Monterey Peninsula and you'll see people with easels and they stand there and they're painting all yeah. along. I can imagine you sitting there and painting with a, a pad of paper, but just writing words and, and the descriptions of the Mackenzie course uh, creates and how it presents itself and how you use words to paint these pictures. What is your research process? Well, it's, it's, um, it's kind of an organic process where I just simply start talking to people initially. And as I go, you know, as I come further along the timeline of these stories, the the, I'm actually able to find more people to, to talk to. And in this instance, I you know, was really lucky. I got to spend a couple days with Byron Nelson before he uh, passed away. Wow. And, um, and hear all of his insights and, and memories and talk about the relationships. And um, I was able to, uh, to spend a lot of time with Ken Venturi. And I think Ken is, you know, over 30 years broadcasting golf on CBS. Um, most people forgotten what a great competitor he was. He won the U.S. Open in 1964. He won, I think, 15 or 20 times on tour himself. He was a top-notch player. Um, and he also, I think, for all those reasons, had a kind of photographic memory and recall. And because he was the youngest of the foursome that day, and because these two older men meant so much to him, and I think, as you read in the book, you see how deep and rich his relationship with Harvey Ward became. Uh, he, that day was etched in his memory. And as we talked about it over weeks and, and even months, he was able to recall every single shot. Wow. And, um, 
And then I was, you know, there's a lot of other, um, I must have talked to 50 people um, who either knew the principles or knew something about them or had some kind of piece of the puzzle that added to it. And then, as you said, the, uh, the there was no substitute for actually going to Cypress Point and playing the course and getting to know it and seeing the angles that they saw. The, the course hasn't changed much in that time. It's It's been really well preserved and um, it's an extraordinary piece of real estate, and it has a great history of its own, which is in the book. And how long did you take to do the research on this book before you were able to present the first draft? I mean, you know, not full time, but uh, I was doing other things at the time. But you know, an interview here, an interview there. Um, what was unique about this is that there was no public record of it. There were there were no written accounts in the newspaper. There were no sports stories, no no photographs to look at. It was all about. Um, oral histories. And then it was, um, I, I was kind of waiting to write it. It was just, I was letting it sort of percolate. And uh, and then Byron died. Um, not unexpectedly, he was 96 years old. and uh, But but it hit me very hard when, when he passed away. It hit a lot of people hard. And I actually sat down and started writing the book the very next day. Fabulous. Fabulous. Is, is this... The way everything is being documented, um, forget the Internet, but just for every golfer out there, every angle of every step that they take, whether it's on or off the course, is being documented. What kind of impact is that going to have for, for writers like you in the next 25, 30, 50 years to be able to look back and say this was history? I mean, is there going to be anything to say? Well, it hasn't been documented already? Well, uh, there's a difference, I guess, between documentation and, and interpretation. Yeah, yes. What's the difference Very between good. journalism and history? Okay. Um, journalism, you're simply reporting what happened. It's it's the story of the day, and and history, we like to look back and make sense of what happened, and and filter it through a context for understanding the people and the events of that time, and invariably that that take is is influenced by whoever the writer is. It can't help but be. There's no such thing as completely neutral history. Um. So it's it's being filtered through your own consciousness, uh, and you're trying to apply as much you know integrity and fairness as you can to to getting the story right. Uh, and then you know as a as a person who's a storyteller, you're you're trying to make it interesting for people. You're trying to tell the story in the best possible way, and that's a you know a unique process to every writer. Everybody's everybody's uh, way of approaching that challenge is different. I. I just have to use myself as a judge. I say, is this a page that I'm going to want to finish and turn to get to the next one? And that's something I try to ask myself on every single page. But you also have a good perspective on that because you are in the the industry. You, you live in Southern California, and you are you work in the uh, what, television or movie? Industry? Well, both. I mean, I've been doing both for years. I mean, I, that's where, where I began my career. Um, I was... Uh, on the, the writing staff of Hill Street Blues for three years, I, I created and ran, co-created and ran Twin Peaks when that uh, was on in the, uh, the early '90s. I've written a bunch of movies, and uh, and I still do that, you know, as a um, a nice way to make a living. And uh, it actually um, is a great complement to this solitary work of writing books. Mm. I've written, I'm still working on my eighth book now. Wow. Um, but I, I I like to to work in different mediums. I like to kind of let the nature of the story dictate which medium it's going to be uh, be in. And occasionally I'll, you know, I'll get an offer to write a studio movie that um, is hard to resist, and, you, you know, you sit down and wrench your brain for a few months. Steve Martin had, had written a stage play and a book about this outrageous meeting of, what was it, Einstein and... Yes, the... Um... Uh, Einstein at the La Panagio. Yeah. Uh, Picasso at the La Panagio. Right, Picasso and Einstein. And yeah. so, so you can see where he was coming from, but, but the fact that you had these players that had never played before together and it was just such an outrageous thing, it's, it's a story you would think that somebody could make this up. Well, it's, but you didn't. Yeah, no, that's the, 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 the great quote that um, um, Vent, Venturi gave me. He said, if... if if uh, this hadn't happened for real and I hadn't been there, I wouldn't believe it myself. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, it it really is uh, an entertaining read. Um, 
It's hard to put down. I wish you all the luck in the world with it. And if it does become a movie someday, um, I hope it's going to be very successful as well. Thank you. Uh, congratulations, Mark. It's really a great piece of literature and uh, a great contribution to, as, as you talk about how golf can reflect what's going on in society. It teaches a lot about West Coast history, pop culture history of the time, and golf history. The book is called The Match, The Day, The Game of Golf Changed Forever. Mark Frost, congratulations and thanks so much for being with us. A real pleasure, Fred. Thank you. Thank you. 